My name is Joe Rosenbaum, president of the California Board of Accountancy. Welcome to the November 4, 2024 CBA meeting. Thank you all for attending this interim meeting. Um, before we before we get started, I had a couple of questions because uh, this is a little bit different than the way we have conducted meetings in the past. So I wanted to verify uh, whether or not we have any public attendance at any of our locations. So for the location in South El Monte, uh, Ms. Reed, can you verify whether or not there are in fact members of the public present? There are no members of the public present. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Aguilera, are there any members of the public present at your Hawaii office? Believe it or not, there's no members of the pres public present here. They're missing out. All right, thank you very much. I do see that we have uh, some uh, some uh, individuals attending via via WebEx, so thank you for that. Um, okay, well then let's get started. Um, the reason I ask about public attendance is that the CBA has provided the opportunity for the public to participate via the WebEx platform and also at our designated locations. When we take public comments, we will begin by taking public comment from those individuals attending the meeting in the Sacramento location first, and then I will ask the moderator to open up the lines for public comment. Any public comment will be allowed uh, up to five minutes. There are no members of the public present at the South El Monte location or the Kihei location. If that changes, the moderator will ask for public content comment at those locations after we um, canvas the Sacramento location. Okay, with that said, uh, Ms. Reed, can you establish a quorum? Joe Rosenbaum? Here. Tony Lynn? Here. Katrina Salazar? Present. Patricia Bachelor? Here. Nancy Corrigan? Present. Ian Tu? Here. Nancy Dong? Present. And Doug Aguilera? Present. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my apologies. Miss Lada also. Present. And okay, very good. Okay, um, allow me to read this into the record. The CBA's mission is to provide, is to protect consumers by ensuring only qualified licensees practice public accountancy in accordance with established professional standards. This mission is derived from the statutory requirement that protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the California Board of Accountancy in exercising its licensing, regulatory, and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. Okay, with that, let's move right away to our agenda item number one, which is public comments for items not on the agenda. Um, Moderator, or first of all, are there any public comments for items not on the agenda here in Sacramento? Seeing none, moderator, can you open up the lines to see if there is uh, any public comment for items not on the agenda? Certainly, and I do see that um, we have enabled the Q&A feature as well as the hand raise feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone would like to make a comment, you may click Click on the hand icon to raise your hand, or our calling users can press star three to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order hands raised. Or you may look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment into the text box and click send. We, again, we will call on people in the order they, their request was received, and each person will have five minutes with a 30 second warning. Are there any comments on an item that is not already on the agenda?
and I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, please. Thank you very much. And I've also been informed that Mr. Jacobson has joined us um, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, next item on the agenda is item number two, and I'll turn it over to Michelle Center. Foundational information on competency-based models. Good morning, President Rosenbaum, members of the board. I'm Michelle Center, Chief of the Licensing Division. Moderator, would you please uh, load the slide deck for me? Certainly, Mr. Larian, if you would go to the PowerPoint for item two. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the board with foundational information on competency-based models to assist in your review of the AICPA and NASBA jointly released exposure draft on a competency-based experience pathway that will be presented in the next item. This is an informational item and no action is being asked of the board. So a good place for us to start is defining what is meant by a competency. I've provided a definition on page one that defines a competency as a measurable pattern of knowledge, skills, and abilities, behaviors, and other characteristics that an individual needs to perform occupational tasks successfully. Moderator, can you please, um, thank you. I've created an example competency related to data analysis for this presentation. It is collect and analyze data from appropriate sources to prepare meaningful and concise reports. So we're gonna be using this competency as we walk through the presentation today. Now, if you think about that example competency, you could probably pull out several knowledge, skills, and abilities, or KSAs for short, embedded within that competency. Okay, so could I please have control of the presentation? Should be on slide three. For our presentation today, let's think about these three. Um, knowledge of the elements in a business report, skill to program in SQL, and ability to use an electronic device to provide a written report. I know there are more things in that competency, um, but does that seem like a reasonable approach? I'm gonna look for the heads in the room here. Okay, I see some nodding, so I'm gonna think, great, we're following along. So one of the advantages of competencies is they are more evergreen, which is important given the speed of changes that occur in our world today. So if we look back at our example competency, collect and analyze data from appropriate sources to prepare meaningful and concise reports, I think it's a fairly evergreen competency because I could argue that there will always be a need to analyze and convey information. But if we look at our KSAs, we'll see they are not so evergreen. Our knowledge of elements in a business report assumes the report will be written the future might eliminate reports and replace them with virtual dynamic presentations. Our skill of SQL programming might be replaced by other programming language or artificial intelligence. Our ability to use an electronic device would be fairly evergreen if it did not mention the written report. This evergreen nature of competencies is one reason why you see them being used in education and the workplace. Many of you probably have personal experiences with thinking about competencies as you hire and evaluate your staff. So now that we've covered what a competency is, let's move on to how they are used in competency-based models and why one would want to transition to a competency-based model. The benefit of a competency-based model is that it transitions from measuring inputs to instead focus on outputs. Inputs are things we believe lead to the achievement of a competency, while an output is a measurement of the competency. For example, minimum course units and years of experience are inputs, whereas assessments and evaluations are outputs. Competency-based models are seen as desirable 
because they are more inclusive and could lead to more confidence that the individual has attained the competencies. They are seen as more inclusive because they are less reliant on how a person attains the competency. Okay, now we've the, we have the basics down. We can move on to the use of competency-based models in the context of licensure. Licensure is referred to as a quote, high stakes um, type of situation because it has a direct impact on an individual. As regulators, we must establish licensure requirements aligned with what is minimally needed to provide safe and effective practice to ensure we are serving our public protection mandate and not setting up artificial barriers. That means that any competency included in our licensure requirements should be set at this minimum level. There are several technical requirements to establish a legally defensible competency-based model. Please note that my simplification and presentation of a typical approach is not meant to convey that this is the only acceptable approach. On page three of the item, I've identified the following three activities. Very much overly simplified, but three activities. First, identify the knowledge, skills, and competencies. Second, identify the assessments and qualifications. And three, develop and implement assessments. So we're gonna walk through each of those three. Starting with number one, identify the knowledge, skills, and competencies. This is the absolute foundation of any licensure framework and like building a structure, if your foundation is faulty, the structure is ruined. Think of this step as a research project. You want to create a body of evidence that establishes the KSAs and minimum competencies most relevant to the job tasks of a new licensee and their role in protecting the public. Let me give you an example. This is from way, way, way back. Um, in my career, um, I was doing a practice analysis for plumbers. I interviewed a plumber, we were at a work site and they were building an apartment building. Uh, he was walking me around and talking our way through the work site. He showed me the plumbing for toilets and he mentioned um, if they aren't done correctly, there could be a gas leak. Obviously in my mind, gas leak, significant health and safety risks. So we paused and we had a conversation. I had him walk me through all the KSAs that were needed to do that particular job task um, correctly and safely. Ultimately, those job tasks and KSAs were included in a survey that went out to all California plumbers. They rated the job tasks in terms of frequency and importance for public safety from the lens of a newly licensed plumber and rated the KSAs on importance. This example illustrates how I went about building a body of evidence for job tasks and KSAs and how it was specifically tailored for newly licensed plumbers and their protection of the public. The focus was not on what would contribute to a better plumber, but on what was necessary. While I practice this analysis might include competencies, competencies can also be derived from the underlying components of tasks and KSAs. When doing so, you should continue to collect a body of evidence to support the minimum competencies. Moving on to number two, identify the assessments and qualifications. Now that we know what minimum comp competencies are needed for newly licensed individuals in their role in protecting the public, we need to move on to identifying which ones we want to measure and how we want to measure them. You are most um, often fitting a competency approach into an already existing licensure framework. That means you should review the components of the licensure model that you plan to keep. You want to ensure they also contribute to the minimum competencies, and you don't want to unintentionally duplicate competencies in your licensure framework. For example, we are, uh, we're not going to eliminate the CPA exam so the minimum competencies should be evaluated to determine if some of them are already included in that exam, and if so, at what level. 
So let's look back on our sample competency, collect and analyze data from appropriate sources to prepare meaningful and concise reports. One might decide that analyzing data is well covered in the CP exam, but the preparation of that data into meaningful and concise reports is missing. Therefore, that competency is not fully evaluated in the CPA exam, and a measure of the full competency may be warranted. The determination of what you want to use as the measure of that competency should include consultation with psychometricians and other measurement experts. There are pros and cons to different assessment types, and some assessment types fit better with certain competencies. So if we look back at our example, you might discard the option of measuring meaningful and concise reports by a multiple choice exam. Assessment experts working with subject matter experts should also identify any concerns with fairness. For example, experts might express a concern with requiring the evaluation of a competency if that competency can only be achieved in certain job settings or industries. Also, competency-based models support the option of using different measures to show the same competency. Thinking about our example competency, you might have evidence that supports the earning of a Master of Accounting degree as one way to show that competency, but another way would be the completion of job tasks that have certain attributes. Given fairness is a measurement standard that should be considered, having an avenue to demonstrate the competency that does not require an advanced degree would be beneficial. The big takeaways from this step, uh, seek advice from psychometrician and other measurement experts. In other words, don't just rely on your subject matter experts. Next, consider fairness. Um, third, all candidates should be held to the same expectations. How they, how they get there may be different, but they should be held to the same expectations. Have a body of evidence to support decisions. Lastly, number three, develop and implement the assessments. Remember that in a competency-based model, we are looking at outputs. That means measures of the competency. These measures need to be technically sound. Honestly, this is where it gets either difficult or expensive. To explain this point, I'm going to classify output measures into two classifications, either centralized or decentralized scoring. Centralized scoring means that scoring of the measure is done by a single entity. The benefit of this approach is that it can utilize standardized techniques to increase the reliability and validity of the measure. Unless machine scored, centralized scoring is usually costly to do properly. Here are a couple examples of measures that might use centralized scoring. For example, a candidate might submit a portfolio of work that demonstrates the achievement of a competency to a single entity that employs designated scores. Or a candidate might take an exam on a computer, such as a CPA exam. Another approach is to use decentralized scoring, which means the scoring is not done by a single entity, but instead is done locally. Um, in our situation, that would uh, most often be done by a supervisor or a firm member. So for example, a supervisor might rate a candidate's attainment of a competency using a supplied rubric. This is where it gets difficult. I've bulleted those difficulties for you on page four of the item. The key to addressing these difficulties is to create as much standardization in the process as possible and require documentation of what was measured so that it can be re-evaluated as needed. For example, you might want to produce descriptive rubrics, have exemplars of all the rubric points. Exemplars are examples of how to achieve the different scores on the rubrics. Require rater training, allow raters to practice, 
have protocols to ensure the raters have knowledge of the candidate's work, require raters or candidates to document what they were rated on. In summary, there are advantages to using a competency-based model, but the development of a model takes time. The process is multi-stepped and requires evidence and the inclusion of subject matter experts beyond CPAs. That concludes my presentation. I hope this was helpful to set a foundation for the review of the CPA competency-based pathway that will be in the next item. I'll turn this back over to President Rosenbaum and we'll do my best to answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that introductory um, presentation on, on uh, competency-based models. Um, do we have any, any questions or comments from anyone on our board? I can't actually see um, if anyone's raising their hand. And, uh, Mr. Jacobson has a comment. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Michelle, the, there's a reference to root problems uh, do you know uh, uh, NASBA came up with it with any uh, uh, root problems? I didn't see any in, in the materials. Uh, I did see some that that the, the staff has come up with uh, later on. But how about NASBA? Uh, what I, and I should say, actually, let me find uh, further. It's um, the artificial barriers. Did NASBA come up with any uh, what the artificial barriers are? Um, Mr. What, what's what specifically are you referring to? Sorry, I'm Michelle. Do you understand the question? Um, I don't think I'm completely following the question, but in relation to your last statement about artificial barriers, yeah. um, NASBA has not. Uh, made reference to any artificial barriers being included in any of the materials that they produced. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other other questions or comments from the board? No. Okay, uh, any questions or comments from the public here in Sac Sacramento? Moderator, do we do we have any um, public attending via WebEx? Yes, we certainly do. Okay, thank you. Then could you please open up the uh, the lines for public comment for those attending via WebEx? Absolutely. If anyone would like to make a comment on the presentation, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand. Our call-in users may press star three to raise their hands, and our and the other option is to look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment into the text box and click send. And are there any uh, comments on this presentation? All right, I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, to items uh, three and four, which will also be presented by Ms. Center. Um, but but I hope you have uh, spent some time going through the materials here. Um, these are both an analysis of um, positions and documents that have been prepared by uh, the national associations, uh, both the AICPA and the National Association of State Board of Accountancy. First item is in item number three on their exposure draft on the CPA competency-based experience pathway. In other words, how, uh, how do CPAs get um, the appropriate experience um, and other qualifications in order to get a license. And the second um, part, item number four, are the proposed revisions 
to the Uniform Accountancy Act and model rules, which would would implement implement this pathway and and other items. So, um, Ms. Center, could you please lead us on a discussion? Item number three: uh, discussion of possible action on the exposure drafts of the CPA competency based experience pathway by the AICPA and NASBA. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the board an opportunity to respond to the AICPA and NASBA jointly released CPA competency-based experience pathway exposure draft, which I will refer to as the pathway exposure draft. The pathway exposure draft is found as attachment one of your materials. It is a standalone document that is being considered for incorporation by reference into the Uniform Accountancy Act and model rules. The pathway exposure draft defines and describes a new pathway to licensure that does not require 150 semester units and instead has a competency component that takes at least one year to complete. The pathway would require a bachelor's degree, certification of competency-based experience, one year of general accounting experience and passage of the CPA exam. The framework of competencies can be found starting on page 12 of attachment one. These are described as model competencies that state boards of accountancy um, may adapt as needed. This is contrary to how the UAA is written. So as I go through each item, I'm presenting it and describing it as how that individual exposure draft um, references um, instead of, of um, trying to interpret um, some of the intent. So the framework defines the competencies as, as either professional or technical as follows. The professional competencies are ethical behavior, critical thinking and professional skepticism, communication, collaboration, teamwork, and leadership, self-management and continuous learning, business acumen, and technology mindset. The techno technical competencies are audit and assurance, tax, and business and financial reporting. Candidates would need to achieve all of the professional competencies and at least one of the technical competencies. So now I'm gonna compare the pathway exposure draft with the three activities we discussed in the previous item. The first one was identify the knowledge, skills, and competencies. So the competencies in the framework are based off of the AICPA foundational competencies framework for aspiring CPAs, which I will refer to as foundational competencies. These foundational competencies were developed for the purpose of guiding instructional programs to help students gain the competencies that will lead them to professional success. As we learned in the prior item, competencies used to make decisions on licensure must be based on what a newly licensed CPA needs to ensure an appropriate level of public protection. The pathway exposure draft does not have a body of evidence to support the use of the foundational competencies for this purpose. Moving on to number two, identify the assessments and qualifications. The pathway exposure draft seems to establish different expectations for different groups of candidates. Namely, those that don't have 150 semester units are held to the professional and technical competencies, but those that do not have sorry, but those that do have 150 units are not. We learned in the prior item that one of the benefits of a competency-based model is that it allows for flexibility in demonstrating achievement of a common set of competencies. Unfortunately, the statement in the pathway exposure draft that asserts those who earn 150 units have demonstrated achievement of the same competencies by earning an additional undefined 30 units is not supported. Lastly, number three, develop and implement the assessments. The information on the evaluation of the competencies can be found in several parts of attachment one. 
Starting on page nine, information on the protocols, including who can serve as the CPA evaluator can be found. The definition of the competencies and job task exemplars are found starting on page 12. And the rubric is included in the competency-based experience certification form, and that starts on page 16. So the PATHMA exposure draft includes what I referred to earlier as decentralized scoring. As I discussed, the use of this type of scoring is difficult to do correctly. While I pointed out ways to improve on this type of approach, the pathway exposure draft does not adequately do so. For example, the rubric is extremely vague. Evaluators are asked to rate if a candidate has quote, exhibited a competency, but is unclear what is meant by exhibited. There are exemplars of meeting the competency, but there are not exemplars of not meeting the competency. This makes it difficult for evaluators to know what distinguishes met and not met. NASBA has informed us that they will provide optional training for evaluators. While I step in the right direction, not requiring training on such a complex set of competencies will most likely result in evaluators having different expectations for what it means to have met a competency. Unlike the CBA's attest experience verification that has work papers as the underlying documentation, there is no such evidence in the pathway exposure draft. This means that if there is a reason for someone else to review the scores provided by an evaluator, they only have the verification form itself as a record of the evaluator's ratings. In summary, staff have concerns with the pathway exposure draft which are documented in the item as well as in the draft response to the UAA committee chairs. And that draft response is found in attachment three. Please note that staff have taken the questions from the exposure draft response form found in attachment two and incorporated them into that draft letter. Staff suggests the CBA request the UAA committee reconsider the approach outlined in the pathway exposure draft and delay the re release of future exposure drafts related to this topic until such time as a thoughtful and technically sound approach is ready to be proposed. Staff recommend the CBA approve the draft response to the UAA committee or provide feedback and delegate authority to President Rosenbaum to finalize and submit the response by the December 6th, 6th deadline. That concludes my presentation, President Rosenbaum. Thank you very much. Um, okay, do we have, or I should say what questions uh, or comments um, do any of our board members have? Um, Mr. Jacobson does, and Ms. Thong does, and Ms. Bachelor does here in South Almonte. Okay, well then let's go in that order, please. Thank you. Uh, on page two of uh, the draft root causes is is mentioned, uh, and I don't see anything that NASBA or AICPA uh, presented as a root cause. Did I miss something? Can you can you point out exactly where you are? Page two. Uh, the third line down from from the top. Are you on, Are you on an attachment of the item, Mr. Jacobson? It's uh, it's the draft. It is attachment, attachment one, um, Mr. Jacobson. I think you're on attachment one, page two, Correct. for everyone following along. Correct. And uh, third line down from from uh, the top. Uh, it talks about root causes of the decline in, in, in candidates. Uh, have they come up with, with, with any uh, root causes? I didn't see any in the materials. Um, Mr. Mr. Brenzella can answer that, I believe. Thank you, President Rosebaum. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, uh, hopefully in response to your question, the AICPA, so the American Institute of CPAs, um, came out with a uh, pipeline advisory initiative. I, I can't quite recall the name of the document, and it kind of it, it it's 
purpose was to examine kind of the pipeline. So uh, the decline in entrance and uh, consider potential potential initiatives that could address talent challenges. They identified around, I want to say six tenants that made up that um, pipeline uh, uh, framework. And one of them uh, related to the cost and time of education. There were other ones related to image of the CPA profession, work-life balance, um, uh, salaries, um, culture, things of that nature. But cost and time of education was one of them. And I believe um, both here in California, nationally, and what the AICPA and NASBA are looking at are potential modifications to licensure requirements that might address cost and time of education. So I would say that is probably, the, uh, as it relates to this item, one of the root causes uh, related to the decline in entrance uh, of the talent. Thank you. Mr. Jacobson, do you have any further questions? No. Okay. Um, I've forgotten who's next. Ms. Dong, I think I'm next. Um, so page uh, 38 of the PDF or page 18 of attachment one, uh, there's a section under certification of CPA evaluator that the candidate um, must complete a minimum of 2,000 hours of competency-based experience working hours. How did they come up with 2,000 hours? Because when I just do the math on that, if you're doing eight hours a day, that's, you know, 250, uh, that's about 250 days of, of work, which is less than a year because uh, one year of uh, working days is 260. So I'm just wondering, how did they come up with 2,000 hours as a minimum for competency-based uh, experience? Do, do, are we, are there any concerns about that? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we, if anyone here has that insight, um, possibly Ms. Salazar. Thank you. Um, I, I did, uh, it was shared with me, uh, that there is a state that has a requirement of 1,950 hours somewhere <coughs> in their rules. I couldn't speak to which state, but that was, um, initially used, I think, as an iteration. I can't speak to how it moved to 2000, but that was sort of um, a, a threshold. And in general, my understanding is that this has sought to sort of try to um, be as adaptable by as many states. So it makes sense that they were um, looking at something towards the threshold with, within the states that were known. So I don't know if that is helpful. Um, say there was a lot of discussion as I understand it and collaboration and um, negotiation probably on these. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Mm -hmm. should, should we increase it so that it's a full year? Because a full year is 260 working days. So that would be more than 2,000 hours. Oh, uh, this is uh, Doug Aguilar, let me let me chime in for a second. I think that in the normal course of a work year, you could work at 40 hours a week, 2,080 hours. And so I think if you take two weeks of vacation, the 80 hours, then 2,000 is roughly the number of hours you would work in a year. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Nice math work, Douglas. <laughs> anything else? Okay. Um, anything further, Ms. Dong? No, thank you. Ms. Bachelor. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my question was part of uh, Ms. Dong's um, question, but I see for general experiences, it'll take 4,000 hours. So that's with the 4,000 hours, that's with a bachelor's degree and not the master's. So you have, this is, I'm looking at a uh, page six, uh, let's see, attachment one, yeah, one page six. So 
And then the um, letter area is C, general experience. So item number two, it says if a candidate requires more than one year of 2,000 hours of company-based experience requirement, then additional hours over 2,000 and the time over one year would be applied to the general experience. And then it says experience must equal a minimum of 2,000 hours and a minimum of one year. Combined competency based with general, it's a minimum of 4,000. So what I'm seeing is it will take one year, 2,000 hours to do competency experience, and then one year, 2,000 hours of general to equal the 4,000. Is that correct? Ms. Centric, do you have a comment on that? So what I do, I do want to point out, this is one of those um, topics where there is a, a significant difference between what is in the pathway document and then what's in the UAA. So um, this document does describe general experiences as being one year. And then it also describes that additional at least one year of being the competency-based. So that is where you see a total of the 4,000 or two years. And that is for those that do not have um, 150 units. So that would uh, exclude those who have a master's degree because they're um, almost entirely are gonna have that 150 unit requirement. So you are correct on that point. Okay. And then my other question was in terms of the areas, the technical areas, you have audit, tax, business and financial reporting. So if they, so they have a, choice is let's say if they pick tax then they would have a general license correct and the only way to get the test license and a license would be the audit and insurance so if they choose tax or business and financial reporting that would be a general license that's my question mr franzella really wants to answer this one <laughs> okay. Really wants to. I don't, I don't know about really wants to. Um, I would say one of the things that uh, I would uh, suggest that members do is not try to examine this within the confines of how our law works um, and how we would adapt this into um, our experience requirement, especially if we have an audit uh, or the attest experience requirement, because when staff haven't done that. And um, secondly, I don't believe it would preclude somebody to do the tax competency within here and still obtain the attest experience requirement, um, depending on what they're doing at their firm, what services that firm offers and how that kind of works. So it's almost, you can kind of look at this similar to how they do the CPA exam under the new evolution where there's the core three sections and then somebody selects a discipline. The discipline doesn't dictate what your ultimate CPA license would be, same applies here. You complete a particular competency does not mean that that's how you're licensed. Uh, to your point, more likely than not, I would presume somebody's going to likely go through the audit competency, but it doesn't disqualify them from doing one of the other ones and still figuring out how to get the attest experience requirement um, under, our, um, under our rules. But again, staff didn't really evaluate it in that kind of way. We just looked at this from a lens of what Ms. Center had identified earlier in the first presentation and examined it that way. Maybe, maybe you could even elaborate because this particular um, pathway uh, document is focused for all, all boards of accountancy and California is one of the very few that have um, what I believe you're referring to, Ms. Patchler, as a, as, as a difference between an A license and a G license. So right. this, um, this pathway doesn't really um, address the situation in California as much. Everyone, uh, most of the other states, I don't know what the number is, but the vast majority of the other states don't have a delineation between a general and an attest. And so whoever gets a CPA license under whichever of the competencies they demonstrate will have a CPA license. 
thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments from from the board? So um, to ensure that we don't have um, duplicate uh, times for public comment, uh, could I ask for a motion right now before we ask for any public comment? Can I have a motion from someone uh, and a second for someone on the board to um, to adopt and to adopt and um, to adopt a, a motion that we would in fact um, prepare and send attachment number three? Mr. Jacobson has the first. I'll second. And Ms. Gordon was there a second. Sorry, did I hear there's a first and a second? Yes, Dan Jacobson's first and Nancy Corgan's second. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other comment now from the board? Ms. Salazar. Thank you, President Rosemont. So th this may be a little nitpicky. Um, I do definitely support the letter. If you go to the very last paragraph, um, I'm going to start with telling you where my thoughts are before I maybe ask for a small edit. Um, I think given the, the issues facing our profession and the fact that we want everyone, ourselves included, to be as transparent and productive as possible in our communications, when I read the last paragraph, um, the phrase, as a thoughtful and technically sound approach is ready to be proposed, that implies that there was not thought um, and uh, in this. And so it might not be a productive statement to include. So maybe if, you know, again, I thank staff for providing the education for us as well as those following along um, virtually about the criteria California has to use. It is really important that any, you know, drafts are responsive to our concerns. So maybe we could, I'd respectfully ask that we might consider maybe just saying responsive to our concerns regarding minimum competencies and ask if that is an option. So thank you for allowing that comment. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, and on, I, for one, on second reading, would would uh, would agree with you on that. Um, can you repeat what your uh, edit would would be? Um, I would say reconsider the approach outlined in the pathway exposure draft, and. Include in any future exposure drafts information responsive to our state's concerns regarding minimum competencies. That, of course, being subject to any wordsmithing after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Under understood. So maybe we can. But basically, um, your your uh, your comment is that we we probably ought to edit that last um, to ensure that we have um, an improved working relationship with uh, with our national associations. Yes, sir. That would be lovely. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I need to answer. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Jacobson. Uh, I'd be happy. I, I will change uh, my motion as the second um, goes along with, with this to incorporate uh, what Katrina has, has mentioned. Okay, so your motion would be to adopt this letter subject to um, some edits in the final paragraph to. Um, as roughly outlined by Ms. Salazar. That's correct. 
And a, a second to that. Oh, I think I'll, oh, okay. I will, yeah, I will revise, I will second that amended motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Corrigan. Okay, are there any further comments from the board on this topic? If not, I'll see if we have any public comment here in Sacramento. Mr. Fox. Uh, Jason Fox with the California Society of CPAs. Um, just a couple of brief comments, not to, to belabor the conversation, but I want to recognize staff's um, excellent thorough analysis on a you know very detailed proposals. I think it's very helpful for the foundation laid out there, and I think a very thoughtful articulation of the issues, questions, potential concerns that California has raised. Um, I do think it's very critical that the board does weigh in on this. These are very critical proposals that are going to have a significant impact. And I think the uh, national and other state stakeholders are very eager to hear what California has to say on this. And so um, I think it's important that the board does submit their letter. Uh, Cal CPA is working on comments as well. We haven't finalized those, but I think directionally what the board has proposed and the questions they've weighed in. Uh, is very similar to our thinking on our analysis of these issues coming from a profession standpoint. Um, so once we have those developed, we'll certainly share those with the board as well. But I think uh, it's you guys are going down the, the right direction and weighing into this process and we'll see what all of the other uh, stakeholders uh, provide as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. And I, uh, I guess I would weigh in and say I too agree with what an incredible uh, amount of analysis and thought um, staff has put into this to this item, and I probably should have mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier. But, uh, but yes, our, our thanks for such a such a great effort. Um, moderator, would you open up the lines to see if we have any public comment for those attending via WebEx? Certainly, we've opened up the hand raise and Q and A options to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, you may click on the hand icon. Our call-in users may press star three to raise their hand. And if you'd prefer, you can click on the question mark icon, type the word comment into the text box and click send. Each speaker will have five minutes with a 30 second warning. Are there any comments? And I do not see any request for comment. Shall I close that public comment feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, with that, we'll call for the vote. Ms. Reed, can you do a roll call? Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Patricia Bachelor? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Nancy Dong? Yes. Christian Lotta? Yes. And Doug Aguilera? Yes. And the motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, continuing on this vein, as I said before, we'll move on to uh, item number four again, uh, Ms. Center. Um, and this is a discussion of possible action regarding the exposure draft on the pro proposed revisions to the Uniform Accountancy Act and model rules. Ms. Center. Thank you, President Rosenbaum. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the board an opportunity to respond to the AICPA and NASBA jointly released exposure draft on proposed revisions to the Uniform Accountancy Act and the NASBA issued UAA model rules exposure draft. I will collectively refer to these as the UAA model rules exposure draft. Attachment two is a draft response for your consideration. You might want to note that the response goes to the chairs of the UAA committee. One of, one of those chairs voiced concerns with the process used to draft the exposure draft. And those, um, that communication is also included in your materials. It is attachment seven. So, um, the UAA model rules exposure draft is found as attachment one of your materials. It consists of two parts with part one focusing on proposed amendments to the UAA and the second part focusing on proposed amendments to the UAA model rules. 
The proposed amendments to uh, Section 5 of the UAA change the education requirements for the CPA exam and add a competency-based experience pathway for licensure. The proposed amendments to Section 23 of the UAA establish mobility for individuals licensed using a pathway included in the UAA and establish substantial equivalency requirements for those licensed using a pathway not included in the UAA. The proposed amendments to Article 3 of the UAA model rules define the competency-based experience pathway and amendments to Article 3 of the UAA model rules define the experience requirements associated with the competency-based experience pathway. In reviewing the UAA model rules exposure draft, staff's primary focus was through a policy lens. Staff found both similarities and differences between the policies that would be established by the UAA model rules exposure draft and those that would be established by the CBA licensure and mobility legislative proposals. The item before you outlines concerns with the UAA model rules exposure draft in the areas of total unit requirements, the competency-based experience requirement, substantial equivalency, and the inclusion of NASBA's National Qualifications Appraisal Service. So let's begin by looking at the total unit requirements. That is addressed on page five of your item. The exposure draft adds a pathway to licensure that does not require 150 units and keeps two pathways that continue to require 150 units. For those following along in the materials, the pathways are depicted in table one on page four. The new pathway that does not require 150 units is pathway C. Alternatively, the CBA's licensure legislative proposal eliminates the requirement that applicants complete a total number of units and instead relies on the completion of at least a bachelor's degree in a concentration of accounting coursework. The addition of the, of the requirement to complete 150 units that occurred back in 2014 did not increase the number of students seeking advanced degrees and no evidence has emerged that completion of 150 units increases public protection. Given this information, one could draw the conclusion that the 150 unit requirement creates an artificial barrier to licensure. Beginning on page five of the item, you will find a description of staff's concern with the policy that competency-based experience be required as part of pathway C. Most of these concerns were already discussed as part of the previous item. The concerns include lack of supporting evidence for the specified competencies in the framework, lack of justifiable rationale for a subset of candidates to be evaluated on competencies not required of other candidates, lack of specification on the model language that the competency-based experience must be in completed in an accounting setting, and a concern with the incorporation of the CPA competency-based experience pathway document in the UAA model rules because the documents will not meet California's standards for rulemaking. The CPA's licensure legislative proposal relies on the foundation of a two-year general accounting experience requirement. The legislative proposal also provides the CBA authority to use the rulemaking process to require the completion of specified job tasks associated with minimum competencies of entry-level practice. This provision of the legislative proposal would pertain to all applicants and not a subset and makes the necessary link to minimum competency for newly licensed CPAs. So let's move on to mobility, specifically substantial equivalency, which is found starting on page seven of your materials. There is a fundamental difference between the UAA model rules exposure draft and the CBA's mobility legislative proposal. The UAA model rules exposure draft relies on a determination of substantial equivalency 
of a state's licensure requirements to the requirements within the UAA. It proposes three options for practice privilege. One, a CPA is licensed in a state that has been determined by the host state or NASBA's National Qualifications Appraisal Service to be substantially equivalent. Two, a CPA is licensed in a state not considered to be substantially equivalent, but the CBA, the CPA is represented in a NASBA national database as meeting UAA licensure requirements. Or three, a CPA is licensed in a state not considered to be substantially equivalent, but the CPA has obtained verification from their home state or NASBA's National Qualifications Appraisal Service that they meet UAA licensure requirements. It is staff's belief that these practice privilege requirements are overly restrictive and that an undue burden would be placed on state boards that choose to implement a pathway not considered substantially equivalent. For example, state boards that wish to use a second option would have to regularly submit licensee data to NASBA and later report additional data for CPAs that later submit uh, evidence of meeting a UAA pathway. Alternatively, state boards could use the third option. While this option does not require them to submit and maintain data in a national database, it would require the state to provide verifications to those licensed CPAs who wish to practice in other states or give that authority to NASBA's National Qualifications Appraisal Service. The CBA's mobility legislative proposal approaches mobility from a simpler and more evergreen standpoint than tying mobility to the UAA pathways. The use of the CPA equals CPA approach with built-in safeguards for consumer protection eliminates overreach and complexity. The last policy concern outlined in the item starts on page eight and it relates to the inclusion of NASBA's National Qualifications Appraisal Service in the model language. The inclusion seems inappropriate as NASBA has no regulatory authority, and this could be construed as giving authority to the appraisal service that is equal to state boards. It is not necessary for the National Qualifications Appraisal Service to be referenced in the model language. In addition to looking at the UAA model rules exposure draft from a policy lens, staff reviewed it from the perspective of the six standards of rulemaking that California is required to adhere to. These standards can be found in attachment five of your materials. Staff noted concerns with the standards of consistency, necessity, and clarity. Several of these concerns were noted, particularly in the footnotes of the item. There is an overall concern with the clarity of the language, as well as specific instances where there seems to be inconsistencies between the UAA model rules exposure draft and the pathway exposure draft. Overall, staff believes the model language presented in the UAA model rules exposure draft is not responsive to state boards that vote voiced frustration with the process of substantial equivalency and how it limits their ability to enhance the licensure requirements in their states. Additionally, there is a concern that the processes described could be perceived as penalizing state boards that decide to implement non-UAA pathways and that the dynamic nature of the profession and the educational system is not served by these proposed standards. CBA's legislative proposals that decouple licensing requirements from mobility create a stronger approach to modernizing and preserving mobility that is more responsive when changes to the profession occur. Staff suggests the CBA consider requesting NASBA and AICPA pause on drafting UAA model language related to licensure requirements, including competency-based experience and instead focus on redrafting the UAA model rules exposure draft with automatic mobility. Staff recommend the CBA approve the draft response letter to the AICPA and NASBA to provide feedback 
and delegate authority to President Rosenbaum to finalize and submit the response by the December 30th deadline. That concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back over to President Rosenbaum. Thank you again, Ms. Center, for a very thorough analysis of, uh, of this. Um, do we have, uh, what, what, what questions or comments do we have from, from the board? Ms. Lada has a question or comment. Thank you. Thank you, President Rosenbaum. Um, there's just an unsubstantive uh, edit I'd like to point out with the typo that I found on an attachment to the second to last paragraph of the our response letter. The last sentence of that second to last paragraph reads, this narrowing of focus to only mobility will provide much needed to time revisit. And I believe it's supposed to be needed time to revisit. So I just wanted to point that out for staff to correct. But no further comments besides that um, typo I discovered. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Um, Ms. Salazar. Thank you, President Rosenbaum. This is really just a comment on this yeah. letter. Um, something really resonated with me that I just think is is worth just sort of highlighting is uh, on page three of five. You know, there's a statement the last if you're on the printed page, the last paragraph there that talks about how the CBA believes that how and if the State Board of Accountancy actively responds to complaints with appropriate enforcement actions is critical. And I just think that's a really, you know, I. I really support that statement, and I, I just think it's worth pointing out that 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 is uh, really kind of key, I think, in this letter. So, um, I appreciate staff putting that in there, and that is, you know, not uh, necessarily how all jurisdictions really view this. And so, I, I appreciate that, um, and do endorse that sentiment. So, thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting that. Ms. Ms. Has a question or a comment? Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm on page two of five of uh, attachment two, nearing the lower half, competency based experience requirement. In the second line, licensure setting because they are not tied to a minimum, to minimum competences, competencies, should it be competencies at the entry level? We need a better editing software, apparently. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that one. Um, you have that. Um, do we have any other board comments at this point? Um, could I ask for then a motion um, to, uh, to adopt the letter uh, and authorize its, uh, its release? The, the draft on an attachment to, <clears throat> excuse me, attachment, in attachment to, can I have a motion to issue the comment letter with the, um, with the edits noted? Mr. Jacobson has his hand raised. Mr. Jacobson. I so move. Okay, do I have a second? Ms. Bachelor, I second. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any public comment from those attending here in Sacramento? Mr. Fox. Jason Fox of the California Society of CPAs. Again, just want to acknowledge staff's uh, very detailed analysis for a very complex issue. Uh, again, these are two related comment letters, but I think the way the board uh, staff has put before the board, you know, comments on the framework and the comments how the framework plugs into the, the overall system, uh, I think were are helpful. And so, Again, we'll be submitting comments as well as shows the board, but I think the, the questions, concerns, and uh, just overall kind of um, adding to the dialogue, I think is important that the board weighed in um, and a very important questions to raise. So thank you. Thank you again, as always. Um, any further public comment in Sacramento? Seeing none, moderator, could you open the lines to see if we have any public comment for those attending via WebEx? 
certainly. If anyone would like to make a comment on the motion or the issue, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand. Our call-in users may press star three to raise their hand. Or the other option is to look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment into the text box and click send. Each speaker will have five minutes with a 30 second warning. Are there any comments? I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, okay, now I guess we can call for the vote. Ms. Reed, can you do the uh, roll? Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Patricia Bachelor? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Nancy Dong? Yes. Christian Lada? Yes. And Doug Aguilera? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have one further item uh, on the agenda, and uh, and actually this relates, I guess, to an earlier comment by Ms. Salazar that, um, you know, we do want to, con to continue to work together with, uh, with our national um, organizations. Um, and this, this discussion is about one of the letters that was received um, about um, the automatic mobility. Um, and I don't know if everyone has a copy of the, the Nevada letter for item five. Okay, everyone has that as well. Um, you can see how they have responded to uh, to that letter that uh, that all the boards received. But I'll I'll now turn it over to Mr. Franzella to uh, to go ahead and lead the discussion on item number five. Thank you, President Rosenbaum. And again, good morning, members. Uh, this will be a brief overview. Uh, but as you may recall, uh, the Thursday of our Meeting in September, members and executive directors throughout the country in all 55 jurisdictions received an email from NASBA's, uh, from NASBA titled uh, Shifting to uh, Automatic, the Hazards of Redefining Mobility. And we had received it Thursday morning and the board was going to be taking up uh, legislative proposals uh, the following day. And really, staff didn't have a lot of time to evaluate those comments in advance of our discussion. And during our discussions, um, a member had asked if the CBA would have an opportunity in the future to consider the NASBA email and whether to respond. So this is that opportunity. Um, as it relates to the actual contents um, of mobility and automatic mobility, I believe the board has uh, taken steps to respond in both its recent adoption of the UA, uh, the exposure draft um, letter that you just uh, approved today and the mobility legislation that the board approved in September. So as it relates to the underlying policy about uh, automatic mobility or more open mobility, I think the board has uh, taken appropriate steps to provide a response. But the question really relates to what's left outstanding is whether or not the board wishes to communicate to NASBA uh, any concerns it had with the method and timing of the email that was sent and um, staff wanted to provide the CBA with an opportunity to consider whether a response should be sent to discuss the process used by NASBA in the lead up and the ultimate sharing of such email. And so on page two of the memorandum, um, staff have highlighted a couple of concerns uh, that the CBA may wish to consider first. The email was transmitted without prior communication from NASBA, so it uh, kind of came out of nowhere um, as it relates to um, the EDs and to the board members. Um, the communication appears to be legal advice to various boards and possibly advocating against certain boards' preferred approach to mobility, which is a bit concerning from a national, national member organization. And then the email created an unnecessary sense of fear and concern especially for four states who already have open mobility or automatic mobility. I know those four states uh, had a lot of uh, concern. And Nevada, as President Rosenbaum uh, had noted earlier, is one such state. And, and 
and they had submitted a response letter outlining their concerns and what their expectations were going forward related to such communications. Um, so at this point, uh, staff is asking whether or not the board would like to send a letter related to the method and timing of NASB communications. And if you do, uh, I would suggest that you delegate the drafting of the letter to the CBA president working with staff based on any feedback and comments members have today and that members identify any of those concerns uh, that they wish to consider. Um, staff have no recommendation on this particular item, um, but wanted to give the board this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Franzella. Um, and I would say that uh, I know, I know you have had um, formal and informal communications um, with the uh, with NASBA regarding regarding this issue. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, as you point out, we've addressed the underlying substance, but I, I, I guess uh, I'm probably uh, leaning toward addressing the, the tone and content of the communications and the, and the, uh, the relation, the working relationship. So I'm, I'm personally uh, of the three items that you point out. Um, I, 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 most react or relate to the uh, to the last one, the unnecessary sense of fear and concern, because I did find it rather, rather uh, unnecessarily threatening. <laughs> um, and then, and, but I, I think if we did a letter, it would it should be something a little more positive. Again, back in the uh, in the idea of of working together, not not working separately and um, maybe noting some of these things, but I, I don't, I wouldn't want it to be, we don't have quite the same issue that Nevada has um, because of the uh, inconsistent uh, treatment of physicians over time. Uh, so we don't really have that bone to pick, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, a communication that we would like to continue to work together with them and, and try to, you know, get a working relationship so that we don't have um, positions transmitted without without warning that um, you know that we do continue to work together so I'd like to see if we can't frame something in a little more positive thought but that's that's my comment on it let me open it up to anyone else on the board to see if they have any reaction or comment regarding uh, the potential sending of a of another communication. Okay, start, with comment. start with Ms. Tu, yes. Thank you, President Rosema. And I um, totally agree with you. And my understanding, and Ms. Franzella can attest to it or not, um, procedurally, something like this normally would have been communicated on your monthly executive, executive officers meeting and or uh, with the NASPA board. So I would ask, ultimately my uh, uh, intention is to make a motion to do write that letter with your discretion as president, uh, working with the uh, executive officer uh, regarding the actual wording of the letter, uh, communicating or um, displeasure, for lack of a better word, of how this would transpire. Um, but was there an explanation why it came the way it did, or was it just jumping the gun? Because I would met, I do know, talking with our executive officer, you normally have your meeting monthly and uh, some of these things already, you have heads up on these kind of big issues. That's a question with for that, you. I can also make a motion that we write a letter. So, um, yes, in response to your question about the monthly calls, Ms. Tu, yeah, uh, the executive directors do have a monthly call. Um, in a normal course of action, that would have been an opportunity for NASBA to share such uh, a communication or that they were anticipating sharing a communication with the boards. So there was an opportunity to kind of understand 
NASBA's position in that kind of dialogue. That was not brought up uh, as Mr. Rosenbaum has mentioned, I have voiced my concerns to NASBA's leadership uh, during our ED calls related to that, because I believe it was an, uh, an excellent opportunity over several meetings to have a discussion on this. So, um, and again, a normal course of business, and I believe that uh, Nevada's letter kind of outlines a couple of those thought processes related to the expectations are that something like this would have been more communicated at least with the EDs, if not the board presidents or chairs in advance, um, and then also probably not posted on NASBA's website um, as well, because again, it just created, it just compounded the issues over time. Okay, um, after Ms. Chu, there was another comment there from Southern California. Yes, Ms. Lada. <clears throat> Thank you, President Rosenbaum. Um, Ms. Chu addressed my question about how they typically communicate with us in general, but I was just curious, is there another mode of communication that they could also take outside of those uh, monthly meetings, or is that usually the, the way they communicate? Any prior communication or future communications to come? So there, there's no limitations to them reaching out to us and having a communication. And actually, Ms. Salazar, through much of the uh, discussions over this past uh, several months, has helped uh, coordinate calls with uh, leadership from NASBA. Um, and any communication I send to NASBA always uh, starts with an offer of, I'm happy to sit down and chat with you about our proposals or about any of your proposals. Um, so they can call me anytime. They're welcome to send emails. I've scheduled meetings uh, or we scheduled meetings and had discussions and at no time was this particular issue um, brought up. I, yes, they'd had concerns about automatic mobility and that part's fine. That reasonable minds can differ. It's the method in which they then sent out this uh, email and put people at unnecessary concerns and fear and potential concerns about their own state uh, laws in those four states who have it. That is the is kind of the root concern that staff have. And to Mr. Rosenbaum's point, I think the idea is to potentially, in a positive tone, uh, lay out uh, what would be reasonably expected going forward so that we can have a more uh, interactive dialogue and you know, reestablish uh, better lines of communication going forward. Thank you, Mr. Franzella. And I just had one follow up comment. Um, I do support issuing the letter to address um, both of those things you mentioned, Mr. Franzella, and um, the timing and method of communication. Uh, in my opinion, it did appear, or they left the interpretation that um, their response was indirect to the California board based on the timing and method, although we might not have been the only board uh, that spurred the way they communicated and what they included in their communication. Um, because of that, I think it is necessary for us to respond. So I support um, responding uh, with the direction of the president um, and in a positive tone as well. I think that's important in this instance as well. So thank you. Is there a second? Oh yes, I'll second thank Ms. You. Two's motion. Oh, okay, so Ms. Tu, you. That's, I made that's... the motion on my previous comment to uh, do write the letter uh, with your discretion and in conjunction with uh, executive officer and then Ms. Lada seconded, yes, with the premise that it will be a bit uh, positive, but kind of outline uh, some of our concern and making sure moving forward, we would have better communication, continue to have better con uh, communication. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Salazar. Thank you, President Rosenbaum. So I am going to beat the drum of the goal of being transparent and productive in communications. Um, I think that these concerns are important to have been in our materials to, for our board. Remember, it has to be an agenda item and discussed. And I think what we're hearing is that, you know, these concerns were felt by board members. Uh, but for me, I feel that 
another written communication is maybe overly formal and unnecessary. Um, we are providing two written communications with a lot of contributions already. I think another one way communication is not going to move us forward in that kind of engaging dialogue. So I would respectfully suggest that the feedback of, of our board um, really should be handled with a Zoom call with NASBA uh, to connect people because I just really believe that a two-way conversation is going to be more productive than a one-way missive in the formal record on our part, even, even if we try very hard to be positive about it. And um, so that is my comment and I will respectfully vote against a letter. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me ask you this question, would it be, um, I mean, I understand the, 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 the notion to have a more personal connection and maybe, maybe the letter, if it does pass, um, would it include that invitation? And uh, I appreciate that. And I think that is a great sort of interim solution. Um, I will also add that uh, NASBA did have a small subset at their, at their meeting recently with EDs. And I was there when they clarified their intent behind this and uh, provided some additional information. So that also uh, is part of why I think that face-to-face -face would be helpful. Um, I will offer that if, um, you know, if it is asked that there be some sort of a, a, a follow-up via Zoom or solely via Zoom, I would be happy to offer any assistance in coordinating as a liaison between the two organizations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any further board comment? Okay, hearing none, I'll open it up to public comment here in the Sacramento location. Moderator, could you please open the lines to see if we have any public comment for those participating via WebEx? Moderator? Moderator, can you hear uh, can you hear us here in Sacramento? This is the moderator if anyone would like to make a comment you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand or you may look for the question mark icon click that type the word comment and click send and our calling you users may press star three to raise their hands are there any comments on the motion and i do not see any requests for comment shall i close that feature Thank you for that. Um, okay, welcome. let's move on to taking the vote. Ms. Reed, could you please take roll? Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Katrina Salazar? No. Patricia Bachelor? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. Nancy Dong? Yes. Christian Lada? Yes. And Doug Aguilera? Yes. The motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Okay, with that, that is the end of our uh, noted agenda. So we will now adjourn. You're welcome. <laughs>